Stanford University. Alrighty, well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm one of your two TAs. Junji is the other one. She's not here today. And uh, we're going to go over today kind of two different, different things. One is just a whirlwind tour of Xcode, just to make your life a lot simpler for the entire quarter and the rest of your life, to make it more familiar to you. And the other thing is how to use the debugger within Xcode in particular. This section is going to be probably a little bit shorter than most sections, just because there's not that much material to get through. So we'll be out of here a bit early. But um, there's, also, there's also no slides or anything like that. There's no lecture to give. It's just I'm going to hop right into a demo. And feel free to stop me at any point. Just shout, raise your hand if something's not clear, if you want to you learn more about something or whatever. And I'll stop and do that. I know going through a giant list of key commands is not like the most engaging lecture, so I'll try to be as engaging as possible. But uh, it is actually super useful. So if, if I want you to have like one takeaway from, from this whole talk, it's that if you want to get good at using Xcode and you want to feel fluent when you're using it, you actually need to know a lot of key commands. It will really help you a lot. You already sort of have been given the lay of the land in Xcode from Paul in lectures, but actually learning all the shortcuts for everything will make your life way simpler. And I hope I can kind of convince you today that all this stuff is actually pretty intuitive. It's not just like memorizing a bunch of random things, but it's all laid out by Apple in a very nice and, and orderly way. So hopefully I can get that point across to you also. So let's just dive right in. Um, I'm going to pop open Xcode here. And I have concentration open, which is the end of, uh, end of Wednesday's lecture. We had this code working. Uh, the, the catch here, though, is that this version of concentration that I'm using right now, I've, I've deemed it sad concentration. You can see right here on this folder because it's actually broken in a few ways. And so we're going to investigate that using the debugger. But before we do that, I'm going to hop in and give you a tour of Xcode uh, using key commands and, and whatnot. So you remember things from lecture where you've seen for example, you can navigate around all the panes by clicking these various buttons, but it's going to get really old really fast when you're coding if you're also having to like move your mouse around in the meantime. You can get like five times faster if you'll just learn, uh, learn how things are laid out and some various things. So the first thing, I'll just kind of go, go through Xcode in order, kind of from the top left. The first thing is um, all the stuff up here at the top left, uh, you can actually do automated by key commands. So instead of going up and clicking run and whatnot, you can do command R and that will run. So there, there are key commands for controlling everything about running and, and stopping and all that stuff. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is more important, which is just how do you actually navigate around all of Xcode. And so there are key commands for doing things like, if you watch the screen right now, I can do this, this, this. And you get really fast at this stuff. We're, we're opening up a second editor right now. Right, so let me just kind of explain how all of this is working and how you can like quickly get your way around Xcode. So I'm going to close everything that I just did. Suppose that we're at a full main screen like this. The way that everything is laid out is very logical, where the leftmost pane, which is called the navigator, is controlled by command 0. That's what shows it. And then the rightmost pane is showed using command option 0. That's what shows and hides the op rightmost pane. And then within each pane, so if I'm on the left pane, if I do command 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you see how up in the top left up here we're going through these tabs? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And then if I do command option 0 and I look at these tabs up here, I just do command option 1, 2, and I can go through all those tabs. So it's actually pretty nicely laid out like that. You just remember that um, command 0 is for showing and hiding, and then the numbers are for tabbing, and then if you add in option, it does the right side. So that's pretty simple. If you just do Command Shift Y, it toggles the, the console and the debugger at the bottom, which we'll be working with more later today. And those commands alone are enough to just kind of like constantly manage your window size, especially if you're programming on a laptop where you only have like limited screen real estate. It's actually really nice to be able to, to use those commands to quickly navigate around. The next thing I'll point out is that um, you, know, you know from lecture that Xcode has uh, two different editors. It has the um, the main editor that we're in right here. And it has also this thing called the assistant editor. So if we do uh, command option enter, it pops open the second pane over here. And then we can do command enter to go back to just one pane. So this is super useful. The one thing that I'll point out about this is that if you go to your, your Xcode preferences window, we have all these things that we, can, that we can toggle, and we won't go through all of this today, obviously, because there's way too much. You can go around and change your font colors and all that good stuff. But there's one option in particular that I would highly recommend that you utilize, which is in, uh, in navigation here. There's this little checkbox that says, navigation uses the primary editor versus using the focus editor. And by default, this is set to using the primary editor. 
And that's going to probably torture you if you use certain other key commands. Let me give you an example. One of the key commands is for opening certain files without having to navigate there in the, in the file navigator over here. So let's say that I we all know that there's a file called card.swift and we want to open it. All I have to do is command shift O for open, type card, and then there's card.swift. And that will open it up. Now what if I wanted card to open up over here in this right pane? So right here I am zooming around in the, in the right pane and I have the right pane selected. If I do command shift O and I go back to view controller, it still opens in the left pane. So if you don't have this use focused editor option selected, it's always going to use the, the left editor or the primary editor for those key commands. So that's why you want to have this box checked. So that now when we go over here and we have the, the right one selected and we do card, it opens it over in the right pane. Make sense? Cool. So I highly recommend that you do that. Okay, the next thing uh, we're going to do is actually uh, talk about text editing within each window really briefly. One thing that I want to point out is um, you haven't dealt with this problem yet because your Xcode projects haven't gotten very large, but they will get very large. There will be lots of code files and eventually you'll have hundreds of files in a single project when you're making a big Xcode uh, project. And one of the things that will help you navigate that is to uh, help yourself by leaving navig like navigation helper things throughout your files. And one way to do that is this comment right here that is prefixed with comment mark. That's not me just saying that handle card touch behavior is below this line. It also actually officially gives Xcode um, this notification in this window up here that that's where card touch behavior is and it'll jump to that point of the file. And so you can imagine big files using these marks is actually super helpful when they're really long to help you navigate around. Um, the next thing that I'll point out about text editing is um, it's very useful just to know basic text editing commands. Like for example, if you have many lines selected and you want to comment them out all of a sudden, just command slash will comment things out like that and then command slash again will undo them. Another maybe even more useful thing is when you get yourself into a, a nasty state like this. Let's just mess some stuff up for no reason. And you can tell that it's very not formatted. We can select everything that we want and do control I, I for indent, and it'll just magically put everything exactly like we want it. So that'll save you a lot of time and headache if things are not, if you, if you can't tell whether things are nicely indented or not. And I'll list these all online on Piazza, by the way, so it's not like you need to note down what they are. I just kind of want to give you the, give you the lay of the land here. So hopefully we're through the, the fast sort of boring part of the lecture where it's just all of the key commands, but I highly recommend that you learn all this stuff and, and start getting it into your muscle memory so that when you're navigating around Xcode, you're not uh, torturing yourself by having to click around everywhere and, and do everything manually. Um, the next thing to do is to actually start using the debugger. So the way that we're going to do that is I've mentioned that we're not actually using the version of concentration directly from the end of Wednesday's lecture. We're actually using a slightly broken version of it. And so let's see what happens when we actually run this one. I'm going to run it on the iPhone X simulator using our trusty command R key command. And let's see what happens. So our app crashed. It doesn't even work right from the start. And we're, we're, we're thrown to the app delegate, which is the main file. Um, it's crashing on the main method, it says, but that's not very helpful. So the way that we first get more insight into this is to look into the actual stack trace, which shows up in the console log down here. And you just see this huge stack trace, which goes all the way into the internals of iOS, all the way down through UIKit and Core Foundation and all this stuff. And it's not very helpful to see all these memory addresses. But if you scroll up to the top, in almost every case, you will see um, what the actual reason for terminating the app was. And in this case, it tells us that there's an uncaught exception called unknown key exception, which we might not know what that is. It tells us that the reason for the crash was, oops, sorry, the reason for the crash was that concentration's view controller, so it already tells us what file something is happening in, um, has some error on set value for undefined key. Unclear exactly what that is because we didn't write that method. And then this class is not key value coding compliant for the flip count label, for the key flip count label. So that gives us even more insight, right, is something is wrong with flip count label. And so if we go into uh, view controller and we go check out flip count label, we actually see flip count label I've abbreviated to LBL here, which is not what it says down in the debugger. Can anyone figure out what's actually going on here? How does it know to print out flip count label? Any ideas? 
if we've named it flip count LBL, then, then why is it printing out flip count label? Can anyone think of why? No? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I named it. What he said was, is that what you named it when you added it to the storyboard? So if we go over to the storyboard over here, actually, let's just open up both side by side using all of our happy new key commands. So we've got the storyboard open over here. I'm going to make this full screen for a moment so it's easier to see what's going on. If we look inside here, we have this thing called flip count label. Now, this, this uh, right here that I've selected is not actually the official name of the object. If I open up our assistant editor over here, and I go over to the view controller, and I look at its rightmost pane, this is where we see all of the things that we've connected. And you can see as I'm going through them, it's showing you on the storyboard what they're actually connected to. Here's where you see that we have this outlet that's na the name of the outlet is flip count label. And it's connected to flip count label. But if you zoom in here, you'll notice that there's a little exclamation point or an empty thing as compared to the normal, the normal dot. So that's it telling you that this thing actually can't find what it's actually connected to. So if we go back over into our view controller in this editor, and we, we rename this what it's actually supposed to be named, and then we go back to uh, the, the storyboard editor, we should see that that error is no longer there. And we actually have flip count label connected. So this is a bug that you'll probably see often at first as you're not quite, I mean, it's just, it's just hard to keep your, your storyboard in sync with your code sometimes. So just know that there's this error about key value coding compliance and that that's what it means. And you should go check this rightmost pane with your view controller selected and that'll help you get rid of these errors. Cool, so we're gonna save that and then we're gonna run it. Okay, great, so it's actually running now. So if we click around to play the game, oops, it crashed. And so if I look down inside the console right here, I don't actually have any logs. It didn't actually show me in the console why it crashed. In fact, I have no info um, anywhere. Let's try and run it again and see if we can figure out what causes it to crash. It looked like that time it crashed when I clicked on a card. Okay, that time it let me click on one of the cards but it still crashed. So let's try it again. See if we can figure out some sort of pattern for what's going on. That time it crashed after four cards. So does anyone have an idea for how we could actually start, start figuring out how to debug this? Like how on earth are we gonna figure out what the problem is? It seems to be crashing randomly after some number of cards and it's not giving us any output in the actual stack trace. Anyone have an idea? Even if you think it's silly, just say some. Say one way we could do this. Print, print statements? Yeah, print statements. So that's an idea, right? Is that'd be really frustrating if we were in a really big app that you already see the problem with print statements. Is if we're going to use print statements, what the heck are we going to do? Go inside every method and type print at every point in the method and figure out where what's going on. We have to inspect our entire app. Imagine we had like a hundred thousand lines of code. That'd be that'd be really frustrating. Um, so. Can anyone give a little more insight into, what, like, think about when the actual app is crashing? Like, at what point is it crashing? When you flip a card. When, when I flip a card. Do you use, like, a breakpoint somewhere? Bingo, right? So he suggests using a breakpoint because it's definitely crashing when we flip a card. So that's a new idea. So maybe each time that the card, a card is tapped, we put a breakpoint inside that method. And then that'll help us uh, hopefully figure out when the, crashing, when the crashing one happens. We'll be able to step through and hopefully figure out what's going on. So the way that breakpoints work uh, in Xcode, and if you haven't used breakpoints before, it's a way for your debugger to, to pause execution of your program on a certain line of code. So if we go inside the, the touch card method, which is we know the first thing that happens directly when we click on a card, we can click over here on the left pane on the line of code, and it pops up this little blue arrow, and that's what a breakpoint is. And that instructs the debugger to please stop there when we get there. I'm gonna pop open the debugger, which is this arrow on the left down here, and you can see that uh, it has this little blue arrow that looks just like this one. And when I click on it, it turns it into gray, which means breakpoints are disabled. All breakpoints in the entire program are disabled. So if you want breakpoints to be enabled, you have to activate them this way. There's also a pane up inside the navigator over here that looks the same way. And it'll show you a list of all your breakpoints throughout your entire Xcode project. 
So you can also go up here to this pane. It turns out that there's even more behavior that you can do with breakpoints than just this. You can also go to this little plus at the bottom left of this pane, and you can set uh, certain special breakpoints. Like for example, there's one called an exception breakpoint. So if I add that, what this does is anytime an exception is thrown, like if you, if you throw an exception in your app, instead of just throwing the exception to the console or crashing or whatnot, it'll actually always by default open the debugger and pause on that line of code. So if you just always have this all exceptions breakpoint running, that'll actually help you when you're developing, for example. So you can actually customize breakpoint behavior that way. Uh, you can also disable individual breakpoints from this pane. So in this case, the touch card breakpoint is active, the one that we just set right here, but this one that I just mentioned about exceptions causing breakpoints to happen, this one is disabled. So you can selectively go enable and disable breakpoints all across every file, all from this one pane, which is nice. But oftentimes, all that you need to do, I'm gonna disable the exceptions one. Oftentimes, all that you need to do is actually within an individual file, set the breakpoint in that one file. So okay, if we run the program now, when I click on a card, we'll see that what happens is we end up on this line of code. So the, the program is paused at this line where we're setting off the card number. And the first thing to point out is that you'll notice in the, in the debugger itself, we actually have a trace of everything that's uh, stored off in memory at this point. So self would refer to the view controller in this case. And you can see, if I, if I zoom in, you can see that it says concentration view controller, and then this is the memory address of the view controller. But it not only gives you that, it gives you a drop-down menu with all of the things that are instance variables uh, stored off on, on the instance of that class. So things like uh, we, have the, we have the instance of the actual game of concentration, and that has lots of properties itself. It has the array of cards, and then it also has that variable index of the one and only face up card. And we can expand cards, and we can look into each card. And then we can find out that the identifier for that card is 5. So you can actually see all of the things that are stored off right here inside of, um, inside of the debugger. So that's super nice. And we could do that to, we could use that to maybe confirm something like maybe, uh, maybe we want to make sure that um, the identifiers that we've set actually have an equal number of pairs of options. So if we go through, we see that the first one has identifier 5, the second one has identifier 3. Third one has four. Four, okay, great, so here's a pair. We shouldn't see another four, right? Then there's a one. And we should see, uh, we should see one through six, correct? And we should see each one twice. So anyway, that would be like a way to figure that out quickly without having to go manually print everything out. Another thing that we can do at any given point is over inside the, the console, LLDB stands for your, your debugger. The DB part stands for debugger. We can actually print out any object that we want to be able to inspect it. So if I do a PO, which means, means print object, I can print out game. Give it a moment. And you notice it prints out this optional concentration because concentration is of type optional. In this case, it's what's called an implicitly unwrapped optional. But you see that it's set off here as the value sum. In other words, it's not nil. The other value in the enum for an optional is sum. So we know that concentration is set here. Another thing that we can do is actually uh, we can print out by just typing P for print, and this will use Swift's magic uh, abilities to, to figure out how to format the thing that we want to print out um, in the way that it thinks is best and most human readable. So if I print out game, in this case what it does is it goes through concentration, prints out cards, all 12 values, and then all the info that we were just looking at inside the debugger, but it does it all there uh, formatted very nicely. And then we know that index of one and only face-up card is nil so far, because this is the first card that we tapped on. We can also do that for any other object. So if I print out flip count label, it prints out that it's a UI label optional. Um, it's a UI view, which has a UI responder. And anyway, the point is P is very nice and it's very helpful for printing anything out whatsoever. So back to our actual bug at this, at this point. We have this problem where clicking on, we, cl we clicked on a card and we're stopped at this breakpoint and we want to figure out why this thing is crashing. So the first thing that we might do to figure out what line we're crashing on in this case, since we're not getting an exception and we have no idea what's going on, is we might go use these navigation options inside the actual debugger here. So if you, if you look in right here, we have a few different options right here. One of them is continue program execution. And what that means is, okay, we're, we're paused at a breakpoint. Just continue running the program until we hit the next breakpoint. Or if there are no more breakpoints, just continue running the program. So uh, let's try that right now. Let's click, um, let's click on Continue running. Okay, in this case, we didn't crash that time that we tapped on touch card, so it's just continuing the program. We're not at a breakpoint right now, so we'll click again. 
Okay, we're back at the same breakpoint, and we can continue again. Oh, and that time the program crashed, and we're not sure what's going on. But we know that it definitely happened right after this first line of touch card. So let's see how we can go into a little bit more detail. OK, so we click on a card again. Rather than continuing the execution, instead, we can pick this second option here, which is step over. Oops, you saw the little help dialog pop up for a second there. I want to get that to pop up on the screen. So you can step over an instruction, which will move you to the next line of code. And we could keep going like this, hoping that this is the time where the crash actually happens. And it's not, unfortunately. So it actually doesn't help us with our problem. Does anyone have any other ideas? How do you think we could go further to figure out what the problem actually is? Take a look at, take a look at this method here. Well, actually, it didn't, it didn't crash that time, so <laughs> that was kind of a, a bad exercise. But I'm just saying, in, in general, um, once we hit the time that it does crash, what's something else that we could do to actually go further? Any ideas? There we go. So she, says, she suggests set a breakpoint inside choose card inside concentration. We're actually not just calling touch card here. We're also calling other methods inside of touch card. And then there's another method after that. There's also update view from model. So actually, this could be crashing anywhere inside this method, which means it could be crashing anywhere inside choose card or anywhere inside update view from model. So one thing that we could do is we could go to both of these methods, like update view from model, and we could set a breakpoint there. And then we could pop open, uh, let's pop open card over here. And we'll go to choose card. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we'll go to concentration over here. And we'll put a breakpoint inside choose card. And now we have three different breakpoints set, as you can see in the breakpoint pane. And that'll, that'll make it stop at um, all the places where it could possibly be at the start of the method. But another, I'm not going to do that right now. Another way of doing that, actually, is to use the, the next option inside the debugger pane. So if we click on something, I'm going to make it back to one window here. Once we get to a method, like choose card, we can see this next option here is step into, and that's how we get inside the actual method. So if I click step into, now we're at the top, top of choose card. And now if we want, we can step over each line inside of choose card. And we can inspect the code if we want. We can read it to make sure everything's OK. We could put extra breakpoints inside here if we see something that might be suspicious. Notice that if we're inside a for loop, that's a lot of <laughs> iterations. It would take forever to step over the whole time. So you can get yourself in trouble real fast if you're stepping into methods that have a lot of behavior going on, but that aren't relevant to actually what's going on. But you get the idea. So let's continue. It looks like it didn't crash that time. Let's, uh, this time, let's step inside update view from model. <coughs> so that's the method that's right beneath this one. And let's step over this. We're going to go through all the indices inside card buttons, which is kind of a pain because we have to go through this big for loop and see if anyone sees anything suspicious in this method. Just point it out, point it out if you see it, if something weird is going on. Anybody? It's the world's worst line of code of all time. What is this? What is this? Who put this here? I put this here because I'm mean, and it's a informationless way to exit your app, right? So we're just actually exiting with negative one. Um, it turns out we're exiting if flip count, which is that thing we're keeping track of at the bottom of the app, is greater than some random number that's generated between you know, 128. What the heck? This line of code doesn't even make any sense, right? But it did actually help us figure out how to use the debugger, because it's like it's giving us no information in the console. So it's, it's, a, nice way to, it's a nice way to figure out um, how to use the debugger. Anyway, uh, so obviously this is the problem. Um, if, we, if we get rid of this completely pointless and insane line of code that I put in there, then we run the program again. We 
we're going to stop at that breakpoint. So maybe we'll, we'll disable it this time because we're not sure if we fixed all of the problems. So we'll, we'll keep that breakpoint there just in case, but we'll disable it and hit continue. And then we'll try to play concentration. See if anything strange is going on. It actually seems like it's working more this time. Also, I'm not actually playing right now. I promise I'm not this bad at this game. But it looks like we fixed the problem. And we know we have fixed one problem because there's not an exit in our, line, in our code, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, are there any questions about using the actual debugger area down here? Did this all make sense to everybody? Everyone understand kind of the general idea? It's actually pretty simple for navigating around the, the memory hierarchy and then using these commands to step through your code. Does that all make sense? OK, cool. One, one thing I want to show you is that the debugger is not quite as simple as just everything that appears in the pane right here. It turns out that there's something inside of Xcode's preferences called behaviors. And this is an Xcode wide thing that's actually really useful and cool. And what behaviors is, is uh, for various parts of running your app, it actually gives you the ability to make custom configurations for when certain events occur. You can say kind of, if this thing happens, then do this thing to Xcode. So for example, right now, um, when we pause inside of, when the app is running, when, whenever we pause, we have this option right here that says show the navigator. We have that checked. So if we change this to hide, for example, then when the app pauses, watch what happens. So we're going to touch on a card. Did you notice that the navigator pane on the left disappeared when that happened? So that's interesting. We've, we've actually set Xcode to say, OK, every time that we're debugging, we might want Xcode to just, by default, just go to a certain state. Because we don't know whenever we're running the app what state our Xcode is currently in. But we know that when we're debugging, we want it to be in a particular state. So you can actually go customize all that stuff inside behaviors. In the interest of time and sanity, I won't go through every single little option. Like we could play a sound when certain things happen or, or whatever. You can actually go through the behaviors pane and kind of check and see um, everything that it can do for you. So it's actually pretty useful. Any questions about behaviors? Does that make sense? OK, great. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, a little bit about what actually the Xcode project file itself contains, because this is kind of opaque to people the first time they use Xcode. So this is your actual project file. It has all these different tabs inside of it. And there's just a lot going on inside <laughs> here. It, in general, I'm not going to go through I'm not going to go through every little point, but in general, um, what I would what I would encourage you to do is understand the difference between build settings and what goes on inside of build settings and um, build phases and what that means. So in build settings here, say that we wanted to do something like figure out what version of our programming language that we're running with. That's something that's going to go into your build settings. We're going to build with that, that in mind. So we can either scroll down and look for that option. Like here we find Swift language version is set to Swift 4.0. Or you can actually use this handy thing because this menu can get kind of large and type something like language, and then, OK, great. Now it's just filtering to just Swift language. So I would encourage you to go through build settings and just see what, what things that there are to change and whatnot. And you'll see this can get actually kind of large um, the more complex your Xcode project is. Build phases is separate from that. And the thing that I would point you towards here is um, this is where you see all the source files that are used inside your app. So this is all the code that you've written, all the Swift files. And then there's this sec second section called link binary with libraries. So that's if you want to actually add a library to use to your project, which we'll get more into later this quarter. Like, for example, say that um, we want to do something in our UI besides just putting a label or a button or any of the stuff that comes stock in UI kit. Say that we wanted to put like a map because we're making an app like Uber or something like that. What we would do is add a new library to our app and type in map. And we find this thing called map kit. And then you type add, and that's where all your, that's where all your adding for frameworks happens. And then we see it created this new frameworks folder over here and it has map kit inside of it. And now we can go inside any file, like view controller. We can go up to the top of that file and say, import map kit. And it's there. That make sense? So those are the things that I'd point out about the Xcode file for now. You'll get more familiar with this um, as time goes on. The one, one caveat I'll, I'll talk about with the Xcode file is um, you all, if you're, if you're using Git or any kind of source control, you will actually be committing the, pro the Xcode project file itself to the repository. And imagine that you're working on source control with other people online, if, if two different people have a merge conflict within the actual Xcode project file itself, that's just a big file that stores off a bunch of data about your Xcode project. That can be kind of nasty to learn how to, to merge those conflicts. So that be, might be something if you're doing source control with your code, it might be worth looking up online ways to help manage um, the Xcode project file itself inside source control, because it's not as simple as doing 
source control inside an actual code file. So that's one, one thing that I'd bring up about the Xcode project file that you'll, you'll want to learn about what it actually looks like internally. So that's all that I have planned for today. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we went over? Does that all make sense? I know it can be a little bit dry just going through a bunch of key commands in the debugger. Yeah, sure. Is it possible to do some sort of version control? Oh, right, sure. So she asked, is it possible to do some sort of version control? So I was just sort of alluding to that when I was talking about um, the Xcode project file itself. The answer is yes. Um, you, can, you can use source control. Most people, pretty much everybody these days uses Git. So I highly recommend that you go learn Git. If you don't know Git, um, you can go online. And quickly, I would recommend there's something called ProGit. And that's a, a free book that you can learn online, learn from online. Uh, let's see where the where the website for this actual book is. Okay, great. So here's this this book called ProGit. And if you haven't used Git before, I highly recommend that you don't just go off and try to like use Git. I, I highly recommend that you go off and you read something like ProGit first, so that you actually learn what's what's going on with Git and how it represents source control under the hood. Uh, it'll really help you because one of the one of the big pain points for people when they're first learning source control is uh, you learn a few commands for how to commit code online and how to send it to other people, but then when you run into a problem of some sort and you don't know how to undo that problem, it's really hard to figure out what's going on if you don't know how Git actually stores things. So it's really necessary to go through and read something like this book to understand how Git works. And then if you don't have a GitHub account yet, go to github.com and immediately create an account and start uh, start creating a repository and learning all the commands that, that are explained to you inside this book. I highly recommend that. It to answer your question again in the back um, about Git in particular, it turns out that um, when you create a new Xcode project, so I'll do file, new project. I'll create a single view app. I'll call it test. And then you'll see that when I'm actually creating the project, I'll put it on my desktop here, it, it actually has a source control option for create a Git repository. So actually, when you check this, it'll it'll put your project with a .git file in the actual directory, and then you can push that online to GitHub. So it'll do that automatically, so you don't need to do it manually. So that's how that's integrated into Xcode. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay. If anything in particular, come up and talk to me afterwards. Otherwise, we're done for the day. Thank you all. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.